Screen's off a little bit. Sorry. Well, good morning. And welcome to Williamstown First Baptist Church. Uh, we'd like to thank all you pews for coming this morning. <laughs> um, we're chuckling a little bit here because, uh, because of the weather here in, uh, in New England, particularly here in, uh, in Williamstown, Massachusetts. Uh, we are down to a, a congregation of four this morning, uh, except for those who are indeed listening uh, to this broadcast on YouTube. So uh, if that applies to any of you, we welcome you this morning. We're glad that you've been able to join us, and we're, we're grateful that uh, to those of you who uh, would normally be here live with us that you didn't make the effort to travel. The roads are uh, a little slippery. Uh, but let's begin this morning with uh, our call to worship. It's from the book of Deuteronomy today. That's chapter 18 and verses 18 and 19. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your, for your prophets of old, and the Lord especially, for the prophet who came in your name as Savior of the world, as Son of God, as King of kings and Lord of lords. And Father, we thank you for the opportunity to witness to his glory and majesty this day, to praise him, to honor him, and to know him better. And it is in his name and the power of his name and the authority of his name that we pray to you now. And all God's people said, Amen. Sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving. And we offer up to you sacrifices of joy we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord and we offer up to you 
sacrifices of thanksgiving and we offer up to you the sacrifices of joy i will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart i will enter his courts with praise i will say this is the day that the lord has made i will rejoice for he has made me glad he has made me glad he has made me glad i will rejoice for he has made me glad he has made me glad he has made me glad i will rejoice for he has made me glad i will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart i will enter his courts with praise i will say this is the day that the lord has made i will rejoice for he has made me glad he has made me glad he has made me glad i will rejoice for he has made me glad he has made me glad he has made me glad i will rejoice for he has made me glad we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the lord we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the lord and we offer up to you the sacrifices of thanksgiving and we offer up to you the sacrifices of joy hey man oh, yeah, please be seated and we'll pray for a moment. I was laughing to myself. Uh, scripture tells us that where two or more are gathered in my name, uh, there you are in the midst of us, Lord. And so we qualify this morning, and we're grateful for that. Uh, but we do want to take time uh, to pray, and partly to pray for God's protection on our way here, but for so many who are traveling um, and other congregations as well, and for our travels home. Uh, but we also want to lift up uh, some updates on our uh, prayer request list that's in the back of our bulletin. Uh, in particular, pray uh, for, uh, for Billy, uh, Bill and Vera's son, Billy, uh, for sciatica pain. We noted that last week. We also want to pray for their granddaughter, Ashley, and husband Christopher, who had COVID, have uh, recovered, and now are expecting that their son Atlas will be induced tomorrow. And Atlas has been diagnosed with severe neurological issues and is not expected to live very long. And so we pray for God's mercy in helping Ashley and Christopher, also for uh, Pastor Chris Adorno, who had been their pastor at Cheshire Baptist for many years, who will be traveling down to Kentucky uh, to be with them uh, today. And so pray for his safe journey uh, down and back. I uh, want to give a word of praise uh, for Diane's uh, dental work that has been accomplished. And also uh, for Ron's nephew, Steve, who was in very serious condition, was in hospice, uh, has now uh, improved so much that he has been removed for hospi from hospice and is in line for a liver transplant. <laughs> so praise God uh, for that. Um, for uh, Ron's half-brother Jim and his wife Barb uh, have recovered from COVID. My brother Rick, who is recovering, we're grateful. Uh, my sister-in-law Gretchen uh, as well. Continue to pray uh, for Rocio and for Sophie, uh, and for Uhania, members of uh, Elena's family, uh, in need of prayer, and we pray that God would watch over them. Uh, we are, as well, as I said, praying for other congregations, 
continue to pray that the Lord would bless Blackenton congregation with a man who loves the Lord and will preach his word in truth. Uh, and we pray that he would provide that pastor soon. Uh, in particular this week, we're praying for Doug Duncan at well, Community Bible uh, and the congregation there. And we pray the Lord will bless Doug and Gail, um, Tyler and Grace, uh, the associate pastor. Well, the pastor, I guess they opted not to use associate. They have a board of elders. Uh, but pray for them as well and for the church. Pray for the other churches in the congregation, uh, congregational area. Uh, and ask that God would bless their services and make sure everyone travels home safely today if they are able to be at service. Do we have anything else I should pray for this morning? I've forgotten. Glad that the students are back and safely, and especially from a COVID standpoint, as well as uh, from a travel standpoint, from the winter break. And I do pray the uh, college has had a number of students test positive. Pray that they would all be well uh, and would heal quickly and that it would not spread. I want to say a particular prayer as well for my sister Cher who works in a facility like the Williamstown Commons, a healthcare facility, uh, and they've had an outbreak there amongst their workers. Uh, we pray that it would not extend to those who are residents and to the residents' families and that the uh, 28 uh, co-workers <laughs> would be healed quickly uh, so that they might be assisted. Chuck, also, if I may, uh, sure. let's lift up my friend James, sure. uh, whose uh, cancer treatment is uh, not as effective as they had hoped. Okay. Uh, they're going to be making some adjustments, so let's pray that uh, the doctors use their skill and wisdom and uh, are able to find uh, a particular cocktail uh, that, will, that will help him. Amen. Yeah, for Tom's friend James. And uh, Char James also has a friend uh, being treated, and we pray for her as well. I say, Char James, we are blessed with two chars. So. Okay, well, let's bow our heads. Father, we are grateful that we could gather this morning, and uh, we are grateful, as Tom said, for the ability to join together uh, as a congregation, even if it's remotely, electronically, uh, via YouTube. We're grateful for that technology. And we pray that you would bless all those who will hear this message, who are worshiping this morning with us. Uh, bless us with uh, a particular joy uh, for having made the effort uh, to be here with us, uh, wherever they are, that you would lift everyone up and give them a sense of your presence uh, in the living room, uh, whether it's on a sofa or a dining room table, uh, wherever it might be. Give them a sense of your presence and bring them into your presence to worship and to praise and to hear your word and to be blessed by it and changed by it this morning. Uh, let it be a reminder to us that you are able, uh, that your word always returns having accomplished the purpose for which you sent it. does not matter whether you send it to us live or remotely. It is your word that is po uh, powerful, not the medium, certainly not the preacher. And so we pray that those who will be occupying pulpits in this area and even around the country uh, would repent uh, and would proclaim only your word uh, and be led of your spirit to proclaim it clearly, articulately, and with good application so that all those who hear might understand and we pray that that word would accomplish the purpose, that it would call people into your kingdom. Uh, you would change our hearts so that we have a thirst and a desire to share that word with those we love uh, who don't know you, and that you would bless them by opening their hearts and making their word, that word effective in their heart as well. Uh, we do pray for... Uh, those that we've named that you would bless and take care of and bring healing, bring provision uh, wherever it is needed. 
uh, and whatever is needed. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, this congregation in particular. We seek your will and we seek your provision. Uh, we seek that you would make us a bright light in this area. We pray that you would bless each one of us who attend uh, with a burning desire to know you and to love you and to walk in your will, to be people of prayer and perseverance regardless of our circumstance, that as we have opportunity, you would open our mouths to proclaim you and to tell of all that you have blessed our lives with. Uh, we pray that you would indeed pour out your spirit on this place as you did at the day of Pentecost and that you would make it so obvious that there is something new and different going on here that others would be drawn to investigate and that they too would be saved, that they would call upon the name of the Lord as Peter admonished those on the day of Pentecost to repent and call on his name. We pray for this country. We pray for the COVID. We pray that you would find a solution for it, Lord, uh, not only for the COVID, but for the passions that surround it. Uh, we pray your forgiveness as your church. We have not deliberated nor spoken kindly to others. And so many times in our culture, we tear each other down in order to justify our opinion and our view. Forgive us that we have let that same attitude enter the church and that we no longer overcome evil with good, but try as it might be to win with a sword. And you have promised that if we live by the sword, we'll die by the sword. And we are dying in this country, Lord. We need people in public places, not only in churches, in public places and schools and in universities who are unafraid to speak the truth, but to do so in love. And please raise up many in this country and give us an attitude of rejection of anything does not, that does not represent you well to those around us in our disagreement. Forgive us, Father. Help us to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind, even to allowing you to direct our words and what we say. Father, bless our time this morning. We are few, but you have said where two or more are gathered. Lord, we know that you can make this this morning a mountain of transfiguration, that Christ's glory might be seen, known, observed, and experienced. Please make it so for the sake of your people and your church, and for the sake of your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And please stand, and we'll praise our God. Well, we find ourselves in a bit of an odd circumstance this morning. You know, the worship leader is not a performer. And to the extent that I do perform in this role... I apologize because my job is to help you the congregation to participate in worshiping our God together as a body as one body so it may seem a little odd to you and it may feel a little bit odd but I'd like to encourage you at the, who are uh, listening at home to lift your voices and sing with me and not just listen to the stream. Join me in worship. Join those of us who are here in worship. Amen. As the deer panteth forth the water so my soul longeth after thee you alone are my heart's desire and i long to worship 
worship Thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To You alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship Thee. You're my friend and you are my brother even though you are a king I love you more than any other so much more than anything you alone are my strength my shield to you alone may my spirit yield you alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship thee I want you more than gold or silver only you can satisfy you alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye you alone are my strength my shield to you my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long perfect submission all is at rest i in my savior am happy and blessed Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior 
her all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Redeemer, heavenly portals, loud with Hosanna's reign. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the world belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Amen. And please be seated. And turn to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, and we'll be looking at chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And that's found on page 1001 in the Pew Bibles. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. And we'll be, if you were singing along with us, you'll notice that there was a line in that last song, that last hymn, prophet, priest, and king. Uh, and indeed, over the next weeks, what we'll be doing is we'll be looking at Christ uh, in those three roles, today, prophet, next week, priest, and the following week as king. Um, as we continue to look at the Trinity, uh, as we have over the last month, but now focusing on our Lord. So let me read uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, and then we'll pray and ask God to bless us uh, with his word. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, 
he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Uh, Let's bow our heads. Father, we pray your blessing this morning and your provision now uh, of a message that will highlight this text, explain it to us, explain it in the context of all of Scripture, and most importantly, explain it in the context of yourself as Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, Bless our hearts. Let what is said be your words. May they be powerful. May they be clear, understandable, and may they accomplish your work in the hearts of everyone who hears, first accomplishing it in mind, that we might all be able ambassadors for the one that we call our King and Savior. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So as I said in prior weeks, what we've been doing uh, is we have been looking at the Trinity, we have seen that the Trinity uh, and the Trinity's makeup is the reason for much of what we see. Uh, The Trinity is three and one, uh, a person, a a Godhead of uh, three individuals, and so community, they've existed together in eternity continue to exist, will always exist in community, but also at the same time in unity of one heart, one mind, and all their work. And we've seen that even in the work of salvation uh, for God's people, that they three were working together, uh, that in that community, even though unified, there was also hierarchy in that the son subjected himself to the father voluntarily, and the Spirit was subject to the Father and Son. And so today we want to look more particularly at Christ, but again, remembering that even though we're focusing on Christ, the three persons of the Trinity are involved uh, in this work of God's speaking to his people. And again, I would say the Trinity and the character of the Trinity is the reason for God speaking to his people. Uh, You might not think of it in such a way. We might think of God as being so otherworldly and so unlike ourselves that you can't imagine that the three persons of the Trinity have a loving, uh, joyful relationship with one another. I thought of myself and Lena, our family. My mom and sister were with us last week, and we enjoyed sitting around the table and talking about what's going on in our lives. And we don't attribute that to God, the Father, and the Spirit, but that's exactly the type of familial relationship that the persons of the Trinity have. They converse with one another. They talk with one another. They always have. They always will. And so if we are made in the image of God, we too will converse with one another and with our God. And just to support that statement that they do talk with one another, I'll give you two verses. One is Jesus' own statement uh, from John chapter 12. What I say Jesus said, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. And then concerning the Spirit in John chapter 16, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. 
And so the individuals in the Trinity are involved in conversing and acting and accomplishing the purpose of God Almighty. Uh, and so this morning, you, uh, many of you wouldn't have a bulletin. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about God speaking, uh, the idea that God spoke, that he spoke by the prophets, uh, and that he spoke by Moses in particular. Uh, that will be the first section. And then verses 2 to 3, he spoke by his son. And of course, speaking involves words, and so we have it broken out uh, into seven different words that were spoken to us by the Son, a word of authority, deliverance, provision, direction, expectation, encouragement, and hope, all to encourage us to hear the Son and listen to him as the disciples were told on the Mount of Transfiguration. And so God speaks, God spoke, uh, tells us here long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Well, consider first of all that God is spirit. John chapter 4 verse 4 tells us that the God who created the world is spirit. Therefore, anything that we hear from God, anything that we see that God might do, God has to purposely make it evident to us. Uh, but there's a problem. We, as flesh and blood, cannot hear or see the work of the Spirit. Uh, Jesus said so when he talked about the work, Spirit's work in salvation. The wind blows where it will. We see the effect, but we don't see the wind. So it is in the people around us. We see the effect. We should see the effect. But we don't see the Spirit and His operation in our hearts. We're told that if we pray, that God will assist us and enable us to speak. We don't see the work Spirit working in us, enabling us. We simply speak, trusting that He will direct our words. We take that first step. And he moves us as the winds direct a ship by driving the sails. And so God must, if we are going to understand him and see his work, enable us to do so. And Proverbs tells us that God has done exactly that. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. He has equipped us physically. Uh, we perhaps know people in our lives. Um, I've only known a handful, either without the ability to see or without the ability to hear. And we see what a detriment that is, a difficulty to them in their lives. Things that I take for granted. I can see the person I'm talking to. I can see the expression. I can see their body language. One of the things that they told us in preaching class was that body language is 70% of communication. Uh, that was a mind blower to me, uh, which as an aside, ought to be a caution to those who trust Facebook, Twitter, email, text, because you cannot get the nuance of body language in any of those mediums. We try to compensate with emojis, with exclamations, with acronyms, lots of laughs or laughing out loud, but we cannot do that. And so we are not truly communicating. And that's why we were admonished even so long ago, I saw that Apple came out 40 years ago, more or less with their first computer. We were admonished back then not to try to resolve issues via email because the nuances of communication were completely lost when you did that. That you might exchange information, but that if you were going to do so, try to resolve a situation that was personal in nature, that involved emotion, you needed to do so face to face. And that same admonition would be true in our current culture. We need to see and hear in order to communicate. 
And so God, giving us eyes, giving us ears, then accomplishes something for us to receive his communication. He creates all that we see. The heavens declare the glories of God, Psalm 19 says. And Romans tells us that that's supposed to be enough for any thinking person to recognize that there indeed is a God outside of the physical universe who has created all things out of nothing, simply by his word of power, by declaring, let there be light. That since the physical world is decaying, God cannot be part of that physical world. There indeed must be a God outside. That's the logical conclusion. But if you start from a presupposition that there is no such being, then you have to accomplish creation via physical means. Ergo, evolution. And yet, our logic would tell us, if we were honest, that there is a God and that he has created all that we see. The universe testifies to it, the simple complexity or the complex simplicity. Everywhere we look, there are things we cannot explain apart from a creator, from a watchmaker. Even seeing and hearing are a combination of multiple different processes, each of them complex in their own way, unable to evolve in such a way that the others would interact with them appropriately because they would have no knowledge of their existence or need. And so if we simply look at seeing and hearing, we would know that there is a God. Not only does he give us something to see, but he gives us communication. Spoke to our fathers. God has created language. Isn't language a marvel? Uh, if you've studied languages, I've had the opportunity, the privilege of doing that a little bit in the last few years trying now to learn Spanish. And you see the very the similarities, but you also recognize the nuances and the things that we learn, we just absorb. I have a three-year-old granddaughter just absorbing the language. She hasn't looked at a grammar book yet. And yet she knows imperatives, no, uh, mind. She knows all of these things without having been taught. Yet yeah, God has given us these, and he, and of course we go back to scripture, has caused those to be in multiple languages because of all that happened at Babel, but that's for another day. Communication, God has created words. He gave us ears, and he gave us something to hear. Not only birds singing sweetly, but he gave us the ability to articulate and express love, desire, like, hatred, passion, sorrow, all of these things through the medium of words and through the nuances and the different types of words. And he did that because he communicates amongst himself one with the other. And in his image, we are therefore going to communicate with him and with one another. But what is the problem in terms of speaking with God and hearing God? Even if we hear words, we might not understand their import if we don't have a proper receiver. Uh, we're told that the natural person, the person solely in the flesh, doesn't accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And so God, if we're going to understand him in particular, he's going to not only have to give us ears, but he's going to have to give us ears to hear. He's going to have to cause his spirit to reside in us. And, of course, now in our culture with cell phones and GPS, we know that all these signals are going through the air. We can't see them, but we know they're there. And only if we have the appropriate receiver can we understand the information that's been transmitted. And that lends itself to the same application of the Spirit. We need the Spirit within us as a receiver to take the words of God 
to make them understandable to us, to open our ears so that we might receive them. And until God does that, it doesn't matter how long or how much I say, it will not be received. And any of us who have tried, or if someone's tried with us before the Spirit resided within us, if we try to logic somebody in to knowing God, to knowing Him through the universe and all these things, it will not happen. It is impossible. And it doesn't matter how many degrees that you get at Williams or Gordon Conwell, if you don't have the Spirit within you, you will not understand the words that you are hearing. And that's why each one of us are grateful to God, not only for eyes and ears, but also for his spirit. Notice, it has to be. God spoke not to everyone. He spoke to our fathers. He spoke to his people. How were they his? By the spirit residing in them. And he chose, for the most part, to speak through intermediaries. He chose to speak through prophets. Yes, he sometimes spoke directly as at Mount Sinai other, and at Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. But for the most part, he's spoken through intermediaries to those to whom he has spoken and given his word that they might then convey it to his people. Who are these people that God chose to speak through? Well, we call them prophets. Prophets. Well, what is a prophet? I uh, always like to look at dictionaries. Uh, in this case, looked at a Hebrew and a Greek dictionary. Uh, sometimes they're helpful, sometimes they're not. Uh, one definition was a proclaimer or expounder of divine matters or concerns that could not ordinarily be known except by special revelation. And so I have that written down, so I've been able to look at it a few times uh, so that I might understand it more clearly. One of, the other, uh, one of the others that I saw was a person inspired to proclaim or reveal divine will or purpose. And you might be surprised to know, I was, that there are over 50 individuals in Scripture identified as prophets. Not always those that we would consider. We think of Isaiah, we think of Daniel, we think of Jeremiah. And yet the very first person identified as a prophet was actually Enoch. And he's not identified as such until the next to the last book in the Bible, in the book of Jude, when Jude said it was about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, the seventh in the genealogical order, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly, of their ungodly deed, ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Abraham was also called a prophet after he had sinned by t telling uh, Abimelech that Sarah was his sister. God told Abimelech, go and talk to Noah, because he is a prophet and he will pray for you, and you shall live. And so people that God spoke to who then conveyed his word to others in order that they might know God or know what he was doing, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, and actually that word by is literally in the prophets. God was in the prophets, speaking through them, using their personalities, using all of their language skills or lack thereof, using their memories, their history, all of those things. God was using them in order to speak. Second Peter tells us no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, 
but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we were supposed to have 30 mile an hour winds today, wind gusts. Uh, I'm guessing that that will happen at some point. Uh, but you can see what happens when the wind gets a hold of something. It just simply carries it, blows it. Found our drain pipe almost in the next yard last year after a, such a windstorm. These men were carried along by God so that they said exactly what he wanted them to say. Uh, the example I use is I have a four-color pen that I make notes in my Bible with. Anytime I make a note, it's always me making the note. And yet, depending on the color, it might be red, blue, green, black. It might be different. The character, the quality of what I write might be different, but the author is still the same. And so it is with all these 50 or so people who are prophets. They were carried along by God because God had a desire to speak to his people not only long ago, uh, but also now by his son. Our call to worship tells us that when Christ came, God was going to raise up a prophet like Moses from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them all that I command him, and whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. And so how is Christ going to be like Moses? The answer is there in our call to worship. God would put his words. Well, unbeknownst to us, not only would Jesus say what he had heard from the Father, he would be the word from the Father. He would be the one that would speak, and God would require it of us. He, like Moses, would be chosen, be appointed by God. We saw that God appointed him, not only the heir of all things, but also he who would rule the world and sit down. He is the appointed one, as Moses was chosen. Moses at one time thought he would be a great leader and he botched it. <laughs> he said he looked at his circumstance, he looked at what God had done with his life. He had been raised, even though he was a Hebrew, in, in Pharaoh's house and given all the benefits of being raised as a prince. And so Moses looked at that and we're told he thought the people would understand that God had raised him up to deliver them. And in fact, Moses was right, but he was wrong about how and when. And so Moses was not sent until he went to Sinai, saw the burning bush. And so then he was sent, he was anointed of God to go and to lead and to tell the people what God had said. He was given a word to speak. He was given a word of explanation, a word of expectation, a word of exhortation. Uh, those three lend themselves to, to memory. Uh, he was going to explain what was going on uh, to the t people of Israel and to Pharaoh and to his people, telling them about Yahweh. Pharaoh said, who's Yahweh? And maybe you're there wondering, even as I'm speaking and you're hearing me and I'm talking about the Bible, and who is Yahweh? Who is this God? Pharaoh did not understand, and so God gave him a demonstration. He raised up Pharaoh, we're told, simply to make that demonstration, that he was more powerful than any other God in the universe. He gave a word of expectation at the time, a forewarning about the events to come, and he gave a word of exhortation and encouragement that we should remain faithful because the God of all history will accomplish all that he has promised to do. And so this was Moses, but now who is this son? 
the second person of the Trinity. Who is this son uh, that we're told that God has now spoken to us by? Whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. And so this, like Moses, he will give us his word, but he is different because he has a word of authority that was foreign uh, to Moses. Remember after Jesus spoke many times, the people were astonished. They were used to hearing scribes and Pharisees refer to and recite uh, prior law, if you will, like a lawyer standing in court. They weren't used to someone speaking with their own authority, being their own law, being the own lawgiver. And Jesus had that authority, and he had more authority than Moses because he was speaking as the Father gave him, but doing it so on his own initiative as heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. See, Moses, Hebrews tells us, is so different from Moses that Moses is the house, but Jesus is the builder. Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has, more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify, to speak what he had heard, to the things that were to be spoken of later. But Christ is faithful as a son, and we indeed are his house, we are his building, we are his church, if we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. And so Christ has more authority. He is the radiance of the glory of God. You'll remember when Moses was in the presence of God and he came down from the mountain, his face shone. But he would put a veil over his face to hide the fact that it was fading away. Being in the presence of God, we sometimes reflect his glory, not Jesus. Jesus is the radiance of his glory. Moses, like all of us, we are in God's image. Christ is the exact imprint of his nature. And so, yes, Christ was going to be like Moses, but different. And that's why God on the Mount of Transfiguration, even though Moses and Elijah were there speaking with Christ, we're told, he said to the disciples, this is my beloved son. The others are not. Listen to him. Hear him. Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets. Yes, read them. They are inspired. The words were given by me. But listen to my son because he is the authority itself. And so, seven different words given us by the Son. A word of deliverance. Moses said, let my people go. God's people are in bondage. God loved them. Moses actually came to the people of the time and said, God has seen your suffering and he has come down to deliver you. Let my people go. And yet what we saw was that after they had been delivered physically, they had not been delivered spiritually. They were still sinners. They were still in need of a savior. And so Jesus, the word of deliverance that he gives us, we're told that in the text for today, that after making purification for sins, he sat down, having accomplished his work. Christ gave us 
that word, and Paul tells us we know that when Christ was crucified, we were crucified with him so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. See, our greatest enemy, our greatest need in our hearts and lives is not Pharaoh, is not the world around us. It's not our economics, it's not our race, it's not our gender. Our greatest need is sin. Why? Because all of those others, race, economics, gender, will all pass away. When we leave this world, we will cease to be any of those. And the question is, where will we be? And that will be dictated by the condition of our souls and the sin in our lives, whether it has been paid for or no. And Jesus tells us, he gives us a word of deliverance. He says, believe on me. Believe and you will be saved. He also gives us a word of provision. Moses gave the people manna in the desert. He gave them water. But Jesus said, it wasn't Moses who gave that to you. It was my father. And again, the manna was something that satisfied their physical hunger. But Jesus said, the true bread of life, the true manna, is he who comes down and gives life to the world. And the bread that I will give is my body broken for you. Jesus gives a greater word because it's a greater deliverance. It's a deliverance not only in this life, but in the next. I think sometimes I want to say to parents, have you prepared your children to live? And most of us, if we're parents, at least growing up, I know, we wanted to make sure they got an education. We wanted to make sure they had a trade. We wanted to make sure they had a way to feed themselves and their families. We wanted to teach them to be respectable, honest for, uh, for, uh, people in this world. So we prepared them to live in this world. But this world is passing away. Have we prepared them for the next? When God sent his son... He wanted to prepare us for the next. He had given some indication of what that would be in the old. But the Father, our Father, wants to prepare his children for the next world. It's not enough for me that my son is respectable and respected in this life. Yes, that's good. What I want for him is to have life in the next world on the day when he passes into the next world to be received and that his sin will not block him from doing so. So a word of deliverance, a greater deliverance than Moses, not just from the bondage to Pharaoh, but the bondage to sin, provision, providing for us what we most needed to live. A word of direction. Moses had given the people of Israel a word of direction. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you. Do them that you may live. That was the direction that he gave. But thankfully, we're told over and over again in the New Testament, it was a word that we could not keep. And there's none righteous, no, not one. We all have sinned. We've all missed that mark that Moses gave us. And so he gives us a greater word of direction. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, as he did that, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And if you go back to Moses, Moses at that time, the people sinned and there were serpents that were biting them, venomous serpents, and they were dying. They were dying by the tens, the hundreds, the thousands. And Moses was told, take one of those serpents that's doing the killing and put it on a pole. And if someone looks at that pole, they will be healed from that bite. Makes absolutely no sense logically. The only way that it makes sense is that God said to do it. 
And now Jesus gives us a greater word, except that this is not a serpent. This is Jesus himself. Remember, the serpent was what was killing. Jesus took what was killing. He took sin on himself. And he was lifted up. He was nailed to the cross. Sin itself, that debt, remember we talked about a few weeks ago, nailed to the cross, that debt. And so he says, if you will believe on me as the people then believed on the serpent, you will live. You will have eternal life. And whereas Moses gave an expectation to the people, if you do them, you'll be blessed. If you won't, you'll be cursed. I put before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commandments and the curse if you do not obey. And that same expectation is laid on us. Everyone who hears these words of mine, Jesus said, and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And he who hears them and does not do them will be like a foolish man. Are you a foolish man, woman, this morning, who hears and does not do them is like one whose house is on sand and the storms came the winds blew and great was the fall of that house yes our word though is not a word of doing it's a word of believing and in the believing that Jesus is Lord that he has saved us now we will try to accomplish the will that we see here in his words all through scripture out of love not out of a desire for salvation. We will do it in the same way that now I love Elena and we're married, and I don't seek to do it to win her hand. I seek to do it because I love her. And so he who hears these words and does them is a wise man. And he gives us a word of encouragement, a word as Moses gave, He tried to encourage the people to do what was impossible to do. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. They could choose it, but they couldn't do it. And so now Jesus comes to us and he says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but in order that the world might be saved through him, whoever believes is not condemned. Whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Ephesians tells us all that we don't have that receiver. We are not the Spirit Uh, We don't have the spirit of adoption within us so that we might call on God as Father. And when we don't have that spirit of adoption, we are still dead in our sins. Ephesians tells us that, but we were dead in the trespasses and sins in which we used to walk. All of us are born DOA. All of us. And when we hear and believe, we are given life, the condemnation that lied lay on us is now removed. God's wrath, the hung over us, Jonathan Edwards would say, or beneath us actually, in his sermon, sinners in the hands of an angry God. God is angry with the wicked every day. And what we don't understand in our culture is that God, because he is so holy, sees every sinner as being wicked And we were like God holding us up by a spider's thread over the pit of destruction, the pit representing God's wrath. That is where each one of us exists and lives until God saves us and calls us into his home. And unless you have believed, unless you have believed in God's solution, given us in the words now that he has spoken through his son. Unless you believe, 
The wrath of God still lies over you, beneath you. You have no expectation that when you leave this world, you will be with him, but you will experience the full weight of the law, as we would say now in our current system of justice. And so we have a way to be delivered, the provision for it, the direction where to go for it, the expectation of what we will get, see when we get there, and an encouragement to go there that God didn't send the Son into the world, but to communicate a means of salvation that was not formally present in this world. And now he gives us a word of hope. The people at that time, in Moses' time, had received a word of hope when they heard that God cared about them. When Moses came with Aaron and the people heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel, seen their affliction and cared about it, they bowed their head in worship. Friend, this morning, God cares about your affliction. He cares about where you are. And he sent his son into the world to give a better word, a word of hope. And we see that everywhere in scripture. And I've taken Revelation as that last great word of prophecy spoken by our Savior, given to him by the Father to give to his people. And we see Jesus not in a manger anymore. We see him in his true glory standing before John in chapter 1. And saying to John, as John fell to his face in fear, fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. If you fear death this morning, come to the Savior. He has the words. He has the keys. He is calling you to come. Jesus, before he ascended, was glorified, said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest for your souls, not just here. Yes, take my yoke upon you, but I will give your souls rest. And then goodness and mercy shall pursue you all the days of your life, because I am the good shepherd. Fear not, I am the first and I am the last. And then as we go through all the 22 chapters in Revelation, it stands at the end of Scripture as a word of hope. Jesus has won. He has won. There is no more battle. He will defeat him, as Luther said, with one word. He will cast Satan into the pit of fire. He will cast death into the pit of fire. Jesus has come, God has sent him to give us an encouragement that today you might be at peace, knowing that regardless of what happens in this world, whether ice storms, whether COVID, whether something worse, we're told that it's coming, friends. We're told the four horsemen are on the ride. Pestilence, famine, wars, false Christ, they are coming as a prelude to our Lord's return. But the victory has already been won at Calvary. And so believe. Jesus has said, all those who believe, all those who believe are not condemned. Not now, not ever. And so the message this morning is the same as the message at the Mount of Trans- Transfiguration. God is saying to you, he's speaking to, through, in his Son. He's speaking to you. Hear him. Hear him. If you will not hear him, you will be like a man who built his house on the sand. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for this opportunity to speak of our Savior. We pray, Lord, that the words were yours. We pray that you'll take them and apply them to our hearts in a saving way. 
that we might indeed come to Christ, hear the word of hope that you have given to him, that he might express it and accomplish it in our behalf. Help us, Lord, to hear him. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen, and please stand, and we'll praise our God. I take pleasure in worshiping you. And I was struck, as Tom was singing, by an image of God coming to the Hebrews through Moses, saying you needed to apply the blood to the doorposts in order to be saved. And this morning, that's the same message, except it's not the blood of a lamb, it's the blood of our Lord. And you need to apply it to your hearts before you go out your door this morning. You see, outside that door in Egypt was destruction and sorrow, the loss of every firstborn, whether you were a slave or Pharaoh himself, of men, of women, and cattle. There was destruction, there was wrath. You need to apply that blood to your heart by belief this morning, and you need to do it certainly before you go through that last door Because there's only two options. We used to watch Let's Make a Deal, and there were three doors. You got to choose one. But there's only two doors when you leave this world. As you step through the door of death, you go to the left to wrath or to the right to heaven. And the one to heaven will not be available unless you have applied that blood to your heart. Friend, do it. Do it this morning so that you can come into his presence into fullness of joy for eternity. Father, thank you for an opportunity to see and hear your word. Uh, We thank you for this medium that enabled us to do it and to be together even though we're distant. And we pray, Lord, that even as we can't see you, we were together in spirit and we know that you are amongst us. Bless us, remind us as we go into the world, wherever we go, that you are always with us. Father, Son, and Spirit, Trinity abiding in our hearts, enabling, giving us whatever we need to accomplish your will. Thank you, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And have a good week.